My name's Christopher Wright, uh, and I'm a professor of organisational studies and leader of the Balanced Enterprise Research Network uh, at the University of Sydney Business School. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Sydney Environment Institute, which brings together researchers uh, from across the university to explore the fundamental relationship between human communities and unprecedented environmental change. My research network, Burn, is one of the seven nodes of the Sydney Environment Institute, and we explore how organisations can aspire to a more sustainable existence, balancing their economic needs with critical social and environmental problems. So part of uh, Burn's role is to identify prominent issues in the general field of business and sustainability. And last year, when we were looking at future events, it struck us one of the most prominent issues in this space is Australia's exposure in fossil fuel energy and in an increasingly carbon constrained world. So tonight we're hoping to address an issue that is absolutely of critical importance to the future of social and economic life and indeed of humanity itself. Our species now faces a critical turning point in its history. Over the last two centuries the growth of our modern global economy has been based fundamentally upon the exploitation of cheap fossil fuel based energy. However, as climate scientists, science has highlighted, the combustion of fossil fuels and the resulting green, greenhouse gas emissions now pose an existential threat to our environment and the very future of human society. Anthropogenic climate change is now underway, evident in a warming world, increasingly intense droughts and floods, sea level rise and ocean acidification. While politicians and businesses obfuscate over the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the latest climate science emphasises our window of opportunity in avoiding catastrophe is closing fast. To avoid dangerous climate change, scientists have demonstrated that the vast majority of known fossil fuel reserves must be left in the ground. In response, new social movements have emerged aiming to reduce humanity's addiction to coal, oil and gas. Technological developments in renewable energy also offer the potential to fundamentally disrupt the fossil fuel economy. Tonight's Sydney Ideas event aims to address these critical questions and ask, do fossil fuels have a future in a climate constrained world? And if so, what does that future involve? So tonight you'll hear um, from three speakers who will come at this question from somewhat different angles. Our first speaker, Ben Caldicott from the University of Oxford, uh, will focus on the issue of fossil fuels as potentially stranded assets. This is the idea that if we take the science seriously, uh, and that we have a defined carbon budget, then we need to reassess the value of fossil fuel reserves that currently underpin the value of major resource and energy companies. This has major implications for the financial viability of the fossil fuel in industry and the global economy. Related to this issue has been the recent emergence of social movements that promote the idea that the vast majority of fossil fuels must be left in the ground. One of these is the fossil fuel divestment movement, spearheaded by environmental NGOs such as 350.org. Our second speaker, Blair Palais, will provide an overview of the divestment movement and its implications for the future of fossil fuels. Lastly, uh, technological innovation and disruption in the area of renewable energy uh, is also critical to our energy future. Our third speaker is the hugely knowledgeable journalist and writer Giles Parkinson, uh, who will provide his view on what has been happening around renewable energy uh, and how this poses a competitive threat to established fossil fuel energy sources. So tonight we tackle the three interrelated themes of fossil fuel futures, stranded assets, divestment and renewables. The structure of tonight's discussion is as follows. Uh, I'll introduce each speaker uh, and they will then have around 12 to 15 minutes each to present their topic, after which we'll uh, have a combined Q&A of around 20 minutes or so. Uh, so there's plenty of time to interrogate our speakers after the three have spoken. OK, let me just um, introduce our first speaker, uh, Ben Caldicott. Ben is the director of the Stranded Assets Program at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment at the University of Oxford. Uh, in addition to this role, Ben is also an advisor to the Prince of Wales International Sustainability Unit and an academic visitor at the Bank of England. Ben specialises in environment, energy and sustainability issues working at the intersection between finance, government, civil society and academe. Prior to joining the Smith School, he was head of policy at investment bank Climate Change Capital, where he ran the company's research centre and advised clients and funds on the development of policy-driven markets. He's also worked at a range of other organisations, including the Think Tank Policy Exchange, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and as a deputy director in the strategy directorate of the UK's Department of Energy and Climate Change. 
So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ben to speak to us on the issue of fossil fuels as stranded assets. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, um, thank you, Chris, for that very kind um, introduction. It's great to be back at the University of Sydney. Um, great to be uh, out of the, the cold in Oxford, I can assure you. Um, so. I've got 15 minutes, and in that 15 minutes, I want to cover five things. I've got less than three minutes each for these things. I'm going to very quickly talk about what stranded assets are, and then I want to focus in on three examples of how stranded assets might relate to Australia, and particular, particularly to the Australian coal economy. Um, and then I want to link this back to, to the divestment question. So in terms of stranded assets, very quickly, stranded assets aren't a new thing. They're part and parcel of the creative destruction that we see in, in market economies. They result from a whole bunch of factors, usually related to competition, technological change, um, accidents, extreme events, and we're all familiar with them, Betamax, um, Kodak, uh, probably Microsoft and Blackberry, and so on. The thing that's of interest and why we do research in this area is not that this is a new phenomenon. The thing, is, that's, the thing that's interesting is, that, is what's driving that asset stranding. And so what we've seen over the last five to 10 years is a significant acceleration in the role that environment, environment related factors play in shifting asset values in different sectors of the global economy and possibly stranding assets. And these are some of the, the drivers, regulation, uh, physical climate change, water stress, um, litigation, technological change in the form of falling prices for renewables, the divestment campaign, social norms, all this stuff. And basically it's not very well understood uh, particularly from those deciding how to invest in different companies and different assets, people that allocate capital in pension funds. And that's why we do research in this area to try and um, reveal how these risks might pan out and how they're relevant and how you can make better decisions as a result of that information. So that, those, that, that's what stranded assets are. Um, a lot of what we've seen in the last few years on stranded assets, as Chris mentioned, is in relation to fossil fuel reserves. So upstream listed fossil fuel reserves listed mainly on uh, the New York and London Stock Exchanges, um, mainly the reserves owned by big international companies, Shell, BP, Exxon, and so on, um, and Rio Tinto and the mining companies, BHP. Um, and that's hugely important. Um, but I, I just want to underline the fact that there are other, other bits of the energy system at risk as well, and I'll talk about these um, in the Australian context in a bit more detail. There is transmission and distribution infrastructure whether that's pipelines or, or um, poles and wires, a new phrase I learned last week, which is great. Obviously, politically very um, interesting at the moment in New South Wales. Um, and then downstream assets, generation assets, whether that's refineries or power stations. And again, I'll talk about some of that in the Australian context. So going upstream to, to, the, to the mines, um, this time last year, I was here and talked about a bit of work we did in late 2013, looking at how um, Australian coal miners and their mining assets might be affected by changes to demand for coal in China as a result of a whole range of environmental factors like air pollution, water stress, um, improving efficiency in uh, the iron and steel sector, energy efficiency efforts, all these things that are listed up there. Um, we talked about China's coal demand peaking in 2014, 2015, um, so last year and this year and also referenced a lot of analyst reports showing that um, people were saying that peak demand for coal in China might happen before 2020. Um, peak demand for coal for China happened last year, um, and this is, this is in complete contrast to the view of most of the mining companies, most of the people who were responding to those claims made uh, here, or the lecture hall down there, this time last year. So th these things are happening very quickly. And the, and the price of thermal coal in Australia has been, has been low, and as a result, um, Rio and BHP are in, in quite a bit of trouble, and all of this has been well documented. So that's an example of you know, the material financial risks associated with um, environmental factors in Australian context. Another thing is, um, is, is the poles and wires. So um, this is a slide I've borrowed from uh, a former colleague of mine at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, but comes from um, the Australian Energy Market Operator and the Reserve Bank of Australia, which shows um, Australian energy demand plotted against Australian GDP growth 
Um, one of the reasons why this is quite interesting over that time period, uh, 2004 on, onwards, is that Australia didn't have a, a recession like many other advanced economies, so it's a good country to look at in terms of this. But basically, you have um, falling demand for energy, um, and uh, the Australian energy market regulator keeps um, underestimating that phenomenon. So you can see the red line, which is historical actual energy demand, and then you see in 2010 the sort of the purple line showing that the energy regulator thought that demand was going to go up, and then you know demand goes down, and then they revise it, and that's the light purple line, and and so on. It might very well um, continue. So there is a a structural problem uh, if you're an energy generator in terms of um, falling demand and consequently oversupply. Um, you've also had retail prices uh, in, in Australia increasing um, very significantly since 2007, apparently doubling, and a, and a good chunk of that increase has been from network charges associated with transmission and distribution. Um, so you've, and that's, so that's a, that's a, a, a bit of a, a problem um, uh, for, for you guys who pay your electricity bills. Um, it's also a bit of a problem for the utilities in the sense that increasing distribution and network charges push, pushes up the bill, makes it more attractive for people to go off-grid and to install solar PV. And that becomes more attractive with the availability of battery storage. The more people that go off the grid um, means that those distribution and network charges need to be paid for over a much smaller or a diminishing number of people. Um, and that further encourages people to leave the grid and, and, and go off grid. And that's a, that, that sort of that death spiral, as it's called in the literature. Energy economists clearly don't lead very exciting lives. Um, is, uh, is something that we're seeing in Australia, despite the fact that your federal government uh, doesn't care very much for renewables. That's another example. Um, and then in terms of downstream and generation, <coughs> um, a bit of work we published last week looking at the least efficient coal-fired power stations in Australia, subcritical coal-fired power stations in Australia, um, is very relevant. So uh, just, to, just to sort of highlight what subcritical coal-fired power stations are, um, they use less efficient boiler technology. They generate, on average, 75% more carbon pollution and 67% more, uh, use 67% more water than the most efficient coal-fired power stations. And it's the first thing, the first technology um, in the power system that you would want to, to kill off, to strand if you're a policymaker, if you were concerned with climate change. So the International Energy Agency, um, for example, in 2013, did some modeling and, and, and estimated that a quarter of all subcritical coal-fired power stations in the world would have to be stranded intentionally by 2020 if we were to keep a two degree window open in terms of climate change mitigation. So these are very polluting power stations. And Australia has a lot of them. 90% um, um, of, of the electricity you generate from coal comes from subcritical, and that's 56% of your, of your electricity. Um, and they account for 24% of your CO2 emissions. Um, and there's 26 gigawatts of subcritical capacity, and you've got capacities and average ages there, and the report has got all of this, and it's on the website, it's been published, so you can have a look at that. Um, those, the, the 26 gigawatts of capacity that you have here um, are in the form of 22 power stations, and those are owned by 19 companies, three of those power stations are owned jointly, and um, we looked at who owns those assets, who, who, which companies um, are exposed to those assets. There was a study that came out, I think, a couple of weeks ago by the um, Australian Conservation Foundation that listed Australia's top 10 um, carbon polluters, and nine of those top 10 own subcritical assets. Um, and we found that four companies own um, 11 power stations uh, that are responsible for more than half of Australia's um, subcritical capacity, so probably plus or minus a bit, 12, 13% of your annual emissions. And those were AGL, Origin, Stanwell, and Delta. Um, and despite the fact you only have 2.2% of um, the world's subcritical capacity, you have the most polluting subcritical capacity. So it's already really polluting, and you have the worst of the worst, um, which is, I guess, something to be, to be proud of. Um, uh, one of the other things we, we found, uh, as I guess is 
perhaps quite an obvious finding, was we, we, we overlaid water stress data with the location of these subcritical power stations and, and found that a lot of those assets were exposed to, um, to extreme, were, were in catchments exposed to extreme water stress. And so there are investment risk implications from this information. If you're an investor, which companies own assets that are most exposed, that are most polluting, because all things being equal, those are the things that might, might be affected by new regulation um, or by divestment or, or whatever it might be. And then there are also policy implications. So if you're a policymaker, you want to transition Australia to a low carbon economy, you know, imagine that happening. You, you, could, you could target some of these assets for closure um, in a more effective way. And this is the list of the owners of those assets ranked by capacity the number of power stations they own, boiler age, the carbon intensity of those plants, the air pollution uh, next to those plants, um, which is something else we looked at, and then baseline water stress in the catchments where those are located. Not enough time to go into all of this, but there's lots of detail in the report. Um, and so to link this back to, to divestment, so we did in 2013 a study looking at the fossil fuel divestment campaign. Um, looking at how, how a divestment campaign could affect fossil fuel assets and also how quickly the, the campaign had developed and what it, you know, what it might mean. Um, and we found that it was the fastest divestment campaign in history and that it could have um, a whole range of impacts. Uh, but one thing that sort of emerged as, as it's grown in importance is this question about divestment versus engagement and which you should pursue and there's been some commentary if some investors go, well, look, we don't want to divest, we're going to engage with these companies, and other people are going, well, you know, if engagement doesn't work, we need, we need to divest. So just some impartial comments on, on those issues based on our research and based on work in this area, um, also in, in relation to the University at Oxford where we've been thinking about divestment too. Um, so the first thing is that uh, the act of divesting doesn't actually affect the share price directly. Um, the direct impact is, is minimal. There's also a bit of downside risk if you're concerned with climate outcomes in the sense that um, if you get a progressive investor to divest, that voice isn't then represented on the board. So you could get a progressive Cowpers or Norwegian Global Pension Fund or whoever it might be. And because they've divested, they, they, they then don't have that positive influence on, on the company. So, those are the, so that's, that's one downside risk. Um, However, our research found that um, the indirect impacts of divestment, particularly via stigmatization, and no doubt Blair will talk a bit about some of these issues, um, can have a very significant impact on the companies through increasing their cost of capital by making their uh, access to capital harder, by, by affecting their customer relationships, by undermining their political influence, which is, for an energy company, really very important and by harming things like recruitment and retention. So it does have an impact, it's just not a direct impact from selling your share. Um, now, going back to the, linking this to the engagement divestment piece, um, you know, the ability of a fossil fuel company to change its business model is actually quite limited. So I think the effect that progressive investors have on fossil fuel companies is not so much in, you know, a CalPERS engaging progressively is not going to shift Shell's business model into a completely different area. What they will do is improve its corporate governance. They'll minimize you know, the bungs they pay in different markets in which they operate. They'll improve their health and safety. Um, and they might improve their responses to local spills, to remediation, those sorts of things. So progressive investors do have an impact, but it's, it's limited to those things, which that's not to say those aren't important. They are important, but you know, these engage, you aren't going to change these business models through engagement is the point that I'm trying to, to make. Um, so I guess the argument that, you know, the big downside risk of, of divestment versus engagement is that you're taking out these progressive, comp these pr progressive investors. That's true, but the progressive investors are only having impact on a limited number of things, not on the underlying, underlying business model. The other thing to quickly mention, I'm probably already out of time, is that um, uh, active ownership engagement is less effective without the credible threat of divestment, um, which sort of seems obvious, but uh, you know, it's worth underlying, um, underlining 
Uh, you've got investor relations departments at the big companies who are very adept at running rings around um, investors. So if you don't, if you as an investor, if you want, if you don't have a clear you know, red line, if you don't have that credible threat, then your ability to shift behavior through engagement is diminished. So that's another, another reason why keeping divestment on the table is important. It helps to hone, it helps to sharpen um, the effect of effectiveness of engagement efforts. Um, and so uh, to the, li the limited extent that engagement can affect the behavior of a fossil fuel company, um, divestment will make it more, uh, the threat of divestment will make it more effective as a result. Um, and then the other thing to mention is that f from, from our experience of interacting with lots of investors on these, these issues, the divestment campaign has done something very positive, which is it's put it on the agenda of pension funds of asset owners around the world um, in a way that wasn't the case before. So as a result of beneficiaries of people that are going to benefit from pension funds writing in, um, board members and others have gone, oh, God, we've got to, we need to deal with all these letters. And then it sort of percolates up and then actually becomes a, uh, you know, a bit of a, it becomes a board issue and it's on the agenda and people go, well, uh, they start thinking about it and, and, and if, if, if they're guided in the right way, it, that can be very helpful because, you know, investors will actually not um, like the quite binary um, static question that the campaigners are asking for, which is, divest from all fossil fuels today or you're rubbish, you know, you know. But investors, that kind of question isn't useful to an investor. It's kind of quite an annoying question. But, if, but, a, but a better question um, is, you know, this is a long-term risk management issue. Carbon risk is a real problem. Climate change is a real problem. How are you going to manage that problem over the long term? Uh, what, what might you do if other people act? Um, what process are you going to have in place to measure your exposure to this risk? What, what strategies could you employ to shift capital away from these risks? Um, and, and that's a very constructive conversation, and that's a conversation that's happening around the world. Um, and despite the fact that kind of the binary static campaign question isn't the right question, actually, it's, a, <laughs> it's prompted this, this better set of questions. Um, and then, uh, just very quickly, I, when, when talking about divestment, talking about stranded assets, we've had a very UK, USA, Australia, you know, conversation. So there is a lot of the world that needs to be brought in. A lot of assets are state-owned, 80, 90% of assets are in fact state-owned, they aren't listed. So how do we have those conversations with owners of those, those investments, with the states that have those investments? How do we talk to the Saudi Arabias and the Venezuelas of the world? Um, and then just from a, my experience at the university, I don't think this is something that's just going to um, to die away very quickly. It's got legs, there's momentum, there's depth. Um, it's not, you know, students won't just graduate and, and they'll get jobs and forget about it. Um, 350 and Blair and others have been very effective in creating cadres of people that will press this issue in the run-up to Paris and long, long beyond that. So I think from an investment perspective, um, you do have to, to look at stranded assets and then you also have to look at the divestment piece too. On that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Blair Palais. Um, Blair is CEO of 350.org in Australia and has been at the front line of moves here and overseas to encourage major superannuation funds, local governments, religious organisations and universities uh, to divest from fossil fuel investments. Um, and in the space of a very few short years, fossil fuel divestment, as we've heard from Ben, has grown to become a major global movement. Uh, and it has spurred furious debate between proponents and detractors in the media and business and government. So it's a critical emerging social movement which is having um, a big impact on political debate around the future of fossil fuels. And I think the, the imp one, I one indicator of that impact is the vehemence of the opposition to it um, from, from all walks of society, including our Prime Minister and Treasurer. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome Blair to the stage to tell us about fossil fuel divestment campaigns. Thank you, Christopher, and thanks to all of you for coming and, uh, you know, taking an interest in the subject on a, you know, weeknight. You could have gone out to the pub, but here you are hearing about stranded assets, divestment and renewables. 
Um, if we could just get the rest of the country and maybe our prime minister to do a bit of that, we could really come a long way. I mean, we're, we're sitting in potentially the, what could be the renewable poster child of the world if we just shift maybe 5% of our interest into solving the problem instead of pretending it's not happening. So I just want to talk about a little bit about the divestment campaign, how it developed and why, and in particular focus that point on moving that 5% of thinking, because it's not 100% uh, we're trying to shift, it's a little bit very fast, and in particular, um, understanding, as, as Giles will talk about, how quickly renewables are coming onto the market at a parity cost. Uh, we don't have to delay new fossil fuels in particular forever. We only have to delay them for a short time in order to make it irrelevant to continue to invest in them. So I think that's critical to think um, in terms of the strategy that we thought about. How will we make a difference on climate change in a world where they're slow to act, limited amounts of policy in key countries? Uh, and this is one way where individuals can get active, step in, and, and make uh, a contribution. So I won't spend hours and hours giving you um, total, you know, deep into the detail, and, and Ben's covered a good bit, but it's worth just mentioning the maths. Um, Bill McKibben was here in 2013 on the uh, tour that talked just about this and de uh, delivered a Rolling Stone article that kind of shifted public thinking by making it very simple to understand what we're up against when it comes to climate change. The only number the world has ever agreed to uh, through international negotiations is to try and stop climate change at two degrees. Haven't gotten any further than that in the detail. We're hoping Paris might be the place. Uh, and then scientists have come in and backed up that 550 gigatons is about all we've got left in our emissions bank, as it were, before we tip past that two degree mark. Unfortunately, as Ben alluded to, uh, money invested in, re in reserves of fossil fuels is, is already at 2860. So we're looking at uh, some numbers there that just don't match up. So we're talking about money that's already invested, ready to go, Shell Oil, BP, are ready to go out, continue developing. Uh, Adani here in Australia, Whitehaven Coal, these are new mines or you know, newly coming to the market. We've invested in them, we're ready to go. So that's a problem, problem number one. So the key here is five times more oil, coal, and gas than, than we can burn. 80% of what we have in reserve has to stay in the ground. So that's going to be tricky from a market-based economy point of view to tell people, yep, we've got that, but we just can't use it if we want to continue to have a livable planet. And here in Australia, leadership, as it were, is going completely in the wrong direction on climate. All of you are highly aware of that, I'm sure. Uh, we've scrapped the carbon tax, one of the first in the world, um, already evident in showing reduction in emissions even in just the short two years that it had to, uh, to make a go at it. Um, Tony Abbott not long ago told us that coal is good for humanity. Uh, I beg to differ. I think it's time we get off of it and we're going to have to make a rapid change out of that. You're going to have to start with a prime minister whose mind moves beyond that to, gee, how are we going to deal with this problem? Uh, Giles can go on for hours about the RIT, but you know, how many ways can we tell renewable energy companies, we just don't want you here? Uh, we have pulled the rug out from under them about 15, maybe 20 times. Giles, can you give us a number when you come up on how many times we've shifted the regs on you know, what we're, enc we're encouraging, we're not, we're changing the number, we want a target, we don't want a target. Uh, there's just no market certainty for people to try and enter this market, and it's been a real struggle. Uh, of late, the new direct action policy paper is looking at voluntary pollution penalties for uh, the hot, top 140 polluters. So we know, we know historically that really works. Uh, when you make something voluntary, everybody just jumps to it and really goes to work. So you know, no worries there. Uh, so enter uh, the divestment movement because we're getting no leadership. We'll have to do it ourselves. So we're looking at, well, what can everybody do? Well, everybody has a bank account, a pension fund, a mortgage in some cases. Uh, they might be involved in a church, they might go to a university or have graduated from a university. This starts to cover a pretty big group of people in the world, in the West in particular. So we started looking at all of these things. How can we set up a system to help people first learn about it and then take action by moving their money out of fossil fuels? As Ben said, it's initially not about the money, it's about taking away the social license to operate as a fossil fuel company because we know we just can't continue growth in fossil fuels. So looking to apartheid as an example, it was extremely successful 
Uh, and Bill McKibben tells the story of after the end of apartheid, the first place that uh, Nelson Mandela went when he traveled out of the country was not to Washington, but was to California to thank the universities for backing the apartheid uh, divestment campaign. So it's an example, it was effective, it was quick. This is moving much quicker than that and we can do more and we can do better. Um, an example of what we and market forces have done is create something called Super Switch, which is just a simple website where you can track what your superannuation fund is doing, how much it's invested in fossil fuels, whether it's taken any stand at all to move, whether it's got a fossil-free option if you choose it, uh, and it allows people to ask questions directly through the system of their super funds. So while it's early days, 10 million specifically moved just through the website, it's really worth mentioning um, that in the time around the setup of Super Switch and, and the launch of it and the year and a half, or not even a year it's been going, local government super here in Australia, $8 billion uh, has been moved across the board out of high carbon risk assets. So, uh, you know, a first big step uh, was a whole super fund doing it, not just a special setup fund, like, uh, but also worth mentioning. Uni Super, thanks to campus organizations uh, who are all invested through Uni Super with their pension, uh, writing to Uni Super within two months, they set up a, a fully divested, fossil free, $1 billion uh, subset fund, social responsibility fund. Uh, fantastic example, can be done, forces them to do the research, and we hope they'll take next steps to look at the broader uh, investment of the whole fund. Um, there's also Future Super, uh, brand new super fund, 100% fossil free, 35 million under management, small but growing, uh, and they're moving into the mortgage market. So it's worth um, you know, looking at that as well. So th there's clearly a market for it, there's growing interest, and there's awareness. Uh, so these things are coming together to see some quick movement. Uh, 17 campus divestment campaigns here in Australia, 400 internationally. Uh, it's worth mentioning Sydney University, which has taken a big step. Uh, partial divestment, a commitment to reduce uh, carbon footprint uh, of all their investments by 20% over three years. It's a great first step, and it's certainly sent them through the process of investigating what they can do and how they would do it. We we'll hope they'll go further and step uh, away from fossil fuel investment altogether. Certainly the university group here on campus will continue to try and push for that. Um, ANU, many of you probably saw the, the battle in the media, uh, the financial review took on the cause to say ANU's divestment was, um, I think uh, Tony Abbott said, stupid was the word in question. Interestingly, Santos was one of the comp seven companies that they dropped from their portfolio, uh, tanked about two months later. It was one of the best moves they could have made. So stupid doesn't really cover it. Pretty smart and actually looking ahead. And if you're looking at stranded assets, now's a good time to start looking at your risk. And gee, that's just what they did. Uh, so, you know, hurrah for ANU for standing with it. Um, they've come under a barrage of attacks and also uh, veiled threats of taking away their funding. So it's something we might all be asking you to voice an opinion about should the federal government decide it wants to start taking away from the university because it's done basically risk assessment uh, when it comes to its, its investments. Um, Stanford University, $18 billion out of coal in, in their... Um, uh, in their fund, and University of Glasgow, uh, 18 million. So 18 billion for Stanford, 18 million for Glasgow. So while, you know, we're not talking about humongous amounts of money yet, it's starting to get kind of interesting. When larger and larger funds start to begin to show signs that they want out of fossil fuels, certainly it makes people think. So just a quick tally of sort of how we've gotten to, uh, the point we've gotten to now. Um, 50 billion moved is the general estimate, very difficult to pin it down very clearly, but that, that's the figure that's been calculated. Uh, 26 educational institutions, universities, uh, cities and counties around the world, 43, faith groups, 72, churches in, in particular, foundations, 67, and a lot of medical groups, the British Medical Association, uh, arts groups, media groups are also starting to look at divesting or have divested. Today, Paris announced that it will go fossil free by the time of the Paris meeting uh, of the COP. That's brand new today, very exciting, leading the way and showing it'll be one of the largest cities by far to take that step. Uh, other cities include Seattle, San Francisco, Portland, Oxford in the UK, uh, one town in Sweden, and uh, quite a few looking at, at making the move since. Here in Australia, Fremantle, Leichhardt, Marrickville, Lismore, Moreland, and Victoria, I think altogether eight uh, councils and cities have divested. Uh, we've talked about Stanford, 
Fremantle's one of the Australian cities. Rockefellers, not a small amount of money, made all their money on oil. They just divested 860 million in assets uh, from coal in particular, uh, and are now one of the leading campaign groups around the world talking about divestment. So uh, they've joined with uh, 350 in the US to talk about it pretty frequently, why they did it, how they do it, They'll do educational uh, workshops for those who want to find a way to look at how you do it. Uh, one of their challenges was their investment company told them when they said they were, would like to divest, uh, we don't know how, so they fired them, hired a new one, uh, off they go. So we're building new, new ways of uh, finding ways to do these things, and that's great, and the faster we can move it, the better. Uh, Australian Quakers, the um, Uniting Church, New South Wales, and ACT was one of the first groups in Australia to, to um, divest. Uh, and a number of the Anglican dioceses around Australia, great leadership, really leading the way. Uh, and on to, you know, I think uh, Ben mentioned some of the Norwegian uh, funds, the, the Norwegian Government Pension Fund, 856 billion, and they've dumped 114 uh, companies that they see as risky, uh, including our own Whitehaven Coal and, they, uh, and Adani, which is the one, the company that's looking at the first mega mine in the Galilee Basin. Uh, they've said they won't touch, they're moving their money away from Adani, uh, and many others. Uh, so it's a start, uh, and uh, they look to potentially divest the whole of the fund, uh, maybe by next year. So they're certainly pushing, they're pushing out, they're investigating how to do it. Um, just worth it, uh, mentioning how important the financial sector has been in talking about divestment, uh, in taking steps, in even recommending that companies do it, uh, World Bank, for instance, uh, but FTSE joining with BlackRock uh, to just begin to tell people about fossil fuel um, risk is a great step to help people understand their risk. Uh, and a few others just mentioned there, HESTA in Australia also looking at, so these are groups that have either moved some money uh, or are recommending to, to their, um, their investors that they begin to manage the risk and look for options to manage the risk. And almost, almost done, but I just wanted to mention that you know, leadership like Desmond Tutu coming out for divestment um, is critical. It, it certainly sends a message that it's a moral campaign as well as a financial one. The morality of you know, can you still be invested in a safe fund with your money there if you care about climate change and also if you think about the risk and you know that the risk will make an impact at some point um, and if you can do something about it now, why wouldn't you take the step? Um, recently, The Guardian has announced a campaign with uh, 350 in particular to push the two largest foundations in the world, um, the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Foundation, to divest from fossil fuel. Uh, and that's, that campaign is really just kicked off in the last three or four weeks, so uh, The Guardian's likely to, to really hammer the divestment campaign uh, over the next six or eight months and raise you know, stories, more stories about where it's happening, how it's happening, how it can be done. So that's kind of the wrap for me. I just want to say um, it's been a great ride. It's been an education in how to do it, why to do it, um, why people care about it, and how they find their own ways to act, whether it's from inside initially to moving their money, cutting up their credit cards in front of a bank at Global Divestment Day. We just had one a few weeks ago. It was fantastic. Uh, it's important, I'll leave it to Giles to talk about renewables, but where do we go next? So you've moved your money, what to next? Um, certainly helping people to find ways to reinvest into renewables, clean tech, and other solutions instead of um, just moving it anywhere uh, is certainly the next challenge for uh, how we as a campaign begin to look for leadership, encourage it, uh, encourage innovation, investment innovation. Um, and it's just worth mentioning that a big part of our job as part of the campaign is to educate fund managers, super funds and banks about the risk, about how fast the campaign's moving, and to help speed up the transition. So we um, are not saying fossil fuel divestment completely or nothing, you get attacked. We're looking for anyone who will take any step to show that it can be done, that it can be done more quickly, and that there's a reason to do it and a way to do it. So thanks very much, and uh, if you're interested, follow the campaign online or find out ways you yourself can divest your, your money and your investments and uh, be part of the effort to find a solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Blair. Okay, our final speaker tonight is Giles Parkinson, who's founder and editor of the excellent online publication, Renew Economy. Um, Australia's leading website on clean technology and climate issues. He's a former, former deputy editor of the Australian Financial Review, 
uh, and a former columnist for The Australian. Giles is perhaps one of the most well-informed people in the country, I'd, I'd argue, on the fast-moving developments in the renewable energy space, uh, particularly uh, the increasing cost competitiveness of solar and wind energy in disrupting fossil fuel um, economies. So please welcome Giles to the stage. Thanks, Chris, and um, thanks for um, thanks for turning up this evening. Um, where am I? Hang on, how to work this? Um, I thought I'd start um, basically with the. Um, we've had a bit of a rundown on the fossil fuels and um, the fossil fuel industry and what they're thinking of the future. And this is BP. They do a big annual report each year to sort of show their investors and their potential investors um, what a wonderful future the fossil fuel industry holds. And um, it's not really worth looking at the numbers, but basically, um, this came out just a few weeks ago, or a month ago, basically while the um, IEA, which is the um, International Energy Agency, which is the red um, mark, it's, that's its forecast if we're going to actually meet those targets that Blair was talking about, the two degrees targets. So they suggest that we're going to be burning a lot less coal and oil. Um, BP suggests that we're going to be, they want to burn a lot more coal and oil. Um, gas, they think it will be twice as much, um, and renewables only about half as much as uh, what the IEA suggests we ought to do. And they base that on two reasons. One is they think that um, the world will never get to a political agreement about um, climate change, particularly at Paris, and they'll be doing their damnedest as they have been doing for the last 20 years to, to stop that from happening, um, along with the rest of the fossil fuel industry, big oil and big coal. The second thing, they presume is the economics. They simply don't accept that um, wind and solar beat their commodities on cost. But they've got a nasty surprise coming. Um, this is their this is their idea of um, their rough idea of the uh, the metrics on solar and wind. Basically, saying that it's um, well. Right now, solar PV is way more expensive than gas and coal, and onshore is possibly competitive and really in 20 years it won't make that much difference and they make this wonderful quote here saying that solar PV in particular is even by 2035 grid scale PV will still require a carbon price to compete with gas. Um, now here's the problem, Wood McKenzie which is the biggest consulting firm to the gas industry in the US said well that's not actually quite right Already there are states at parity um, with gas and solar in the US and by um, 2020 there'll be 19 um, states and that'll be 30, 38 by 2030. Um, so basically it's their own industry telling them that what they're thinking is, is, is wrong. And we've got some practical examples. I'm going to skip past that one. This is Georgetown, Texas. Um, a city of about 55,000 people, right in the heart of uh, West Texas, right in the heart of the oil, um, the oil industry. And uh, these crazy hippies, as you can see, have just um, announced that they're going to go 100% renewables. Um, not in five years or in ten years' time, but in two years' time. Uh, they, um, the council, the people, the um, the, uh, the city uh, council, which owns the local utility, uh, had to renew its contract and it looked to see what was the cheapest alternative and it decided that without a doubt it was a wind and solar. So they signed a contract for about 140 megawatts of wind to be built nearby and just last week uh, 150 megawatts of solar. Or maybe it was the other way around. So they basically said, look, we're not particularly greenies here, we're not really that fussed about, we don't really believe that much in climate change, but the reason why we're doing this is that it's actually cheaper and it makes sense. So they're not going for 10% or 20% or 30% renewables, they're going 100% renewables and they'll be doing it within two years. And there's other cases of that in America as well, um, particularly even in Texas, Austin, Texas has a commitment to go 50% renewables by 2030 and basically for the same reason. So that's pretty exciting. Um, another oil town is Dubai. Um, I was there in the end of January, um, well actually at Abu Dhabi, but it's all part of the United Arab Emirates. And while I was there, the big talk was this 200 megawatt solar plant tender that had just been completed. Um, it would be the first big solar plant in uh, the Gulf states, and it would be built at the cheapest price ever for a solar plant, less than six cents a kilowatt hour. 
Now the significance of that is that it's about one third the cost of gas generation, which is what they use at the moment for 99% of their electricity. And they're going, uh-huh, that's pretty interesting. Um, a couple of weeks later, the, um, the National Bank of Abu Dhabi said, well, basically, we are making a big change towards renewables. The, coal, the oil price, as we all know, has fallen dramatically. And they said, at this price of solar, even if oil came down to $10 a barrel, which is about one quarter of where it is now, probably one fifth, it still can't compete with solar. And so what it was talking about was this massive change that um, they think is inevitable. And it's interesting to talk to the people in Abu Dhabi. Um, the energy minister gave a speech talking about let's end fossil fuel subsidies. There's a guy from Saudi Arabia who's saying, well, our plan is to export solar to Europe, not just oil. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Saudi Aramco, which is the biggest oil company in the world, said that it would be putting solar PV on all its installations. And um, the um, and I talked to interviewed the guy that was. Um, who runs the company that's going to be building this 200 megawatt solar plant. It's not a Mickey Mouse company, it's worth $25 billion. It's got a generation portfolio um, which is half the size of Australia's entire grid. And he said that um, there'll be a huge amount of generation built in the Gulf and um, the Middle East and North Africa over the next 10 years, about 140 gigawatts. That's about three times the size of Australia's grid. And more than half of it will be solar. It'll be solar PV and it'll also be solar thermal, the solar towers with storage which are now coming in. And together he said that will provide base load electricity at cheaper than anything we can do with fossil fuels. And it's just a bit of a no-brainer for them to go in the future. And that's actually a good thing. One of the reasons why the Saudis would do this, the Saudis, for instance, um, burn, well, 55% of their electricity needs comes from oil. And that's way too expensive. And so what they're looking at doing now is to increasingly have wind, well not, there's not much wind in, in Saudi Arabia, but solar, so that they have actually more oil to um, export overseas. And you may think that's a bad thing, but it's actually quite a good thing. The, um, the Saudis have been, and the other Gulf states have been keeping up the supply of oil, uh, which has pushed the uh, price down. Um, their oil is cheap, but it's also clean. And if you bring the price of oil down, what you're also doing is stopping the investment happening in the Arctic region and in the oil sands and in all the deep water reserves, which are horrendously expensive, but are also horrendously polluting. So as long as we've got cheap um, oil and, um, and cleaner oil from, from the Gulf region, that's probably actually a good thing for the planet because oil production is not going to disappear entirely. Um, Elsewhere, similar things are happening. In Chile, um, they're building solar plants now with no contracts, just basically on the merchant market. This solar plant has been built to supply electricity to the biggest copper mine in Chile. Um, those miners have no fears about, um, about renewable energy. Um, and it's basically cheaper than any other option they have. The interesting thing about that, copper, that um, solar plant is actually being, is now 40% owned by Origin Energy of Australia who um, know a good deal when they see one. Um, so basically the story is, is that any country which needs to build new generation is finding that renewables, wind and solar are a cheaper option than coal or gas. Deutsche Bank came out with a report a couple of, um, a month ago or so, and they noted that in India, the price differential from solar to coal four years ago was seven to one. Now it's one to one. That's an extraordinary change in four years. And India now has a target of building 100 gigawatts of solar over the next five years. Um, China have got the similar target, 100 gigawatts by 2020, actually a bit quicker than India. I'm not too sure if solar is cheaper than coal at the moment in China, but what the Chinese are doing at the moment is they're adding in the environmental impacts of coal. So they're banning basically coal-fired generation in a lot of the eastern cities. The last one will close down in Beijing um, later this year. So once you add in the environmental impacts, um, there's, no, there's no question that it's, um, that it's cheaper. And it's also to point out that the International Energy Agency says that solar and wind are the best answer to address all the problems with the one billion people around the world who don't yet have access to electricity. And I'm going a bit slower than I thought I would. Australia, 
that's going really slow at the moment. We've um, heard renewable energy target, thanks to the Abbott government, or since the Abbott government came in, has basically come to a, a, a stop, simply because of uncertainty. They're under a lot of pressure from the uh, fossil fuel country companies to um, wind back the renewable energy target. What this picture is of is the Nincan Solar Farm. This um, is basically being built based on subsidies and a program that was um, produced by Labor. It was a pretty badly conceived program, but at least it got this one built. Um, and there's a couple of other solar farms and wind farms which will happen around the ACT. You've got a very progressive government. Um, and apart from that, really nothing's happening in Australia. It's come to a complete stop. Um, which is pretty sad. And today, actually, Banco Santander, which is the uh, Spanish bank, it's the biggest bank in Europe by market capitalisation. It's the biggest lender to renew finance your renewable energy um, developments in the world. And it announced today that it was packing up and leaving Australia because it's um, sick of the place and it's got better business to do elsewhere. And that's pretty sad. Um, this is supposed to be a picture of a house with panels. Even though the large scale targets come to a large scale buildings come to a halt, the small scale, there's a big revolution happening, what's called behind the meter and on rooftops. Australia, despite the Abbott government, is the biggest installer of um, rooftop solar in the world. We're now at penetration rates of 25, 26% in South Australia and Queensland. Um, 1.3 million houses have rooftop solar. They're finding it, it's about half the price of grid uh, provided electricity. Um, as Ben mentioned, um, the cost of the poles and wires has pushed up the, um, the cost of so, um, electricity so much that it's actually cheaper to boil a kettle in the outback with a diesel generator than it is in the city, in the suburbs, which is quite ridiculous. So what we're seeing now is roof to, um, households still, 15,000 a month, are still putting rooftop solar on their, um, uh, household, still putting solar on their roofs um, each month around Australia, and businesses are too as well. There's one quarter of new installations are going on rooftops. This one's in Byron Bay. Um, it basically matches 80% of their energy needs. Um, there was a time when a lot of manufacturing in Australia went overnight because of cheap electricity. Now they're finding the cheapest electricity is during the daytime, which is a good thing. The next big thing will be storage. Um, this is Redflow, this is an Australian company. It's rolling out its products now. Um, it says that it's competitive with a lot of tariffs, particularly in Europe because of the way they're structured there. Battery storage, no one's quite too sure where it's going to be at parity, but it's getting there pretty soon. Ergon Energy in Queensland is a big network operator, big, po big poles and wires. It's already installing 100 much bigger um, battery storage things, um, installations than this because it's cheaper than upgrading the network. And that's where storage will find its niche, both in homes, in businesses and in networks, um, de defraying the cost of conventional um, technologies. Combined, that's going to be really interesting. Um, UBS say that the com combination of solar and storage will make it cheaper for houses in Sydney and Melbourne to go off grid by 2018. It's only three years away. Deutsche Bank came up with a similar um, uh, prediction last month. And so what we're seeing is that the 100 years of domination of total control by energy companies is now being challenged because people can do it in their own homes, businesses can do it in their own businesses, and they can start to compete. And so the CSIRO came up with a big, um, a big report um, early last year suggesting where we're heading and um, there's two lines here to, to, to look at. One's the red one and one's the green. It's really a, the next big battle in, in, in home generation is going to be with the networks and with the retailers and the incumbent industry and through regulation. We know it's cheaper but you can sort of slice and dice a tariff a million different ways. Um, all the independent experts say that to move with this technology, like um, Kodak had to do with digital films, well it didn't do very well, um, mobile phones uh, and the internet, they're going to have to change their business model. Of course they're making a lot of money at the moment um, doing things the old way, so they're resisting. CSIRO pointed out that if they do resist, then by um, 2040, and it'll probably be about a decade earlier than this, um, you might see this green scenario, whereas one third of all consumers actually leave the grid. They just get sick of the retailers and the network operators and they just go. Um, if they do um, evolve their business models, then maybe they can still get a connection with the household, but the households will be providing and businesses will be providing 50% of their own energy needs. 
uh, or 50 per cent of all demand requirements, which is a major um, move from centralised generation. Um, so this is the final slide. Um, so that's where the big change will happen. We've got 1.4 million homes now, more than 4 gigawatts, 15,000 new homes each month. Battery storage are coming down, costs are coming down fast. We've got new retailing models. Um, we've got a lot of community ownership proposals, both for investment in solar farms. Um, up in the Northern Rivers where I'm living at the moment, um, there's a community owned retailer which is being formed which has a completely different model to the current retailer. And that's been the model we're seeing in the US increasingly, where towns are buying back their grids, and also we're seeing in Europe, which has underpinned the, the generation there. We've got councils, the Sunshine Coast, Fremantle, and a half a dozen councils in Western New South Wales looking to put large solar plants in their own area, which they can then either for their own needs or to deliver to their own businesses. Um, Blair mentioned before some of the councils looking at zero, zero emissions. These are one, some of them looking at 100% renewable. Byron Bay, Lismore, Urala, Coffs, Port Macquarie, Newstead, Yak and Danda, and there's a whole lot more. And it's interesting, even the network operators can see, particularly in Queensland and WA and in South Australia, that it actually makes sense to take some of these regional towns off the grid because it's cheaper to provide local energy there and store it and have a local network. Once you start doing that, then that becomes progressively more economic and makes more sense in larger towns and then in the major cities itself. So we're going to see a complete change in the, um, in the way that electricity is generated and the business model. And then one final thing is about the um, corporate buyer. It's not just Texas towns which are choosing to go 100% renewables, it's also the biggest companies in the world, the Googles and the Apples. They're doing it a little bit for um, um, corporate image reasons, but a lot of them now are doing it because it actually costs less as well. And that's particularly the case with Dow Chemicals and IKEA. It's just easier for them to get electricity from wind and solar, in the case of IKEA, on their own rooftops. And I predict that that will hopefully, but I think it will happen in Australia. Just imagine if Australia Post, with all its different little um, combined together to, to source its needs through um, renewable energy, or even the Catholic Church, which is talking a lot about um, its own environmental and climate responsibility. Imagine all the schools and all the hospitals and all the other assets that they have under their own wing and they chose to have their own solar generation um, within those, um, on those properties, that's about $2 billion worth of revenue um, that will be taken away from the incumbents. So that's a really interesting prospect and one which may happen. There you go. Thank you very much.